All right. Welcome to NFL Outdated Cover 2 Series. I am really excited to welcome former Iowa and NFL offensive lineman Julian Vandervelde. How's it going? It's going well. It's going well. Having a, a nice day here. Yeah, well, you know, for me, any day I get to talk about football is a nice day, and especially uh, with someone who has uh, played the game and and uh, knows uh, so much about the inner, inside, uh, you know, things about especially the offensive linemen, and we're going to get into that a little bit today. Uh, but what I wanted to start start off with was uh, your time at Iowa. You know, um, uh, you you really uh, were there at, at some uh, you know a great time and. Um, Give us a little bit of uh, some of your highlights and, and maybe memories from your time at Iowa. I feel very fortunate to have played at Iowa when I did. Um, you know, I, I grew up, my uh, seminal years of watching football uh, were the the early Kirk Ferentz years with, uh, you know, the, the Orange Bowl team with, you know, Robert Gallery and Brad Banks and Freddie Russell and all that. Um, you know, and then, uh, you know, had moments like the catch, uh, you know, the, the Drew Tate years and everything. So that was kind of my, um, you know, when I was growing up, that was why I idealized Iowa football so much, uh, you know, and I came in to the program after some of the biggest recruiting classes um, that I would have to that point. It was like Kirk's first, like real, uh, you know, like tip your hat sort of, or a feather in your cap sort of recruiting classes. So, uh, you know, coming in with a bunch of four and five star guys and we had Dace, we had, uh, you know, Dan uh, Doring, Wes Ashelman, you know, Andy Kumpel, all these, uh, you know, awesome, awesome dudes. Um, so I came in and my, my whole mindset was literally just like, I'm this fat nerd from Iowa, you know, from Davenport, like, you know, I'm coming in behind all these just amazing, uh, you know, athletes and, and big time recruits. And, uh, you know, and I'm just going to like, I'll hang back, I'll watch these guys, like I'll ride the bench for four years, and then maybe as a fifth year senior, I'll get a chance to, you know, get in there and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, earn a starting spot and, you know, maybe try out for an NFL camp or something as an undrafted free agent. Um, and then just everything kind of turned on its head. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, going into the second year, um, you know, maybe not as sure in myself as the coaching staff was in me, uh, you know, to, to have the ability to, to earn a starting spot there and then, uh, you know, start for the next couple of years. Um, I got to be a part of some, some really cool games. Um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm really appreciative of the, the type of team that we had. Uh, you know, there's you always kind of think about the the what ifs, you know, like what if Ricky doesn't get hurt? What if, uh, you know, Jake Lee and Double D don't uh, don't get caught up in the, you know, freshman like credit card thing that went on? Um, you know, you have those, you know, those kind of thoughts. But at the same time, like you what happened happened and you can't dwell on it. What you can, you know, hang on to are, uh, you know, are the awesome memories, both, you know, on the field and off the field. My experience at Iowa um, you know, as a student athlete and the kind of the, you know, the different cultural associations and things I was able to do, um, you know, the friends that you make there, but, you know, stuff like, you know, the Sean Green, uh, you know, season, uh, you know, getting to uh, to be a part of that environment with being Penn State um, when the student section did the green out and, uh, you know, going down to the Outback Bowl and, you know, the whole SEC speed controversy and, you know, mm -hmm. being South Carolina and all that stuff going to, uh, you know, and winning, um, you know, I think that's Iowa's only BCS Bowl win, um, you know, was that uh, that Orange Bowl against Georgia Tech. So, uh, you know, we have plenty of highlights. Um, you know, we ended our, our careers on a win. Um, and I, I always remember one of my favorite, uh, you know, things that ever happened was off the field moment where after that final game, um, you know, Missouri, uh, in that inside bowl was very, very highly touted for their pass rush. They had the, the most sacks in the country and they had, um, oh, was, uh, was that Alden Smith? I think they had, who yeah, was, yeah. you know, who was like second in the country in sacks and ended up being a first rounder, great NFL player and stuff. And, uh, and so that was a huge focus for us was like, man, if we can keep, Ricky up, you know, we feel like we have a chance, uh, but man, that pass rush is nasty. Um, and, uh, and after the, the game that was, you know, I still remember coach Morgan coming over, uh, you know, to the offensive line and just holding his hand up like this, he's like zero sacks. And we're all just, <laughs> you know, it held off kind of this, uh, you know, this, this rushing front. Um, so it was, uh, it was, you know, the, that last game, I think is probably the best highlight that we could have ended on as well. Absolutely. It, and was, you know, Reese, one of those coaches that helped kind of develop you as well, Reese Morgan. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, grandpa Reese was the best. Um, I don't think, I don't think I could have asked for better, a better coach. You really do. You have to get into a situation where you have a coach and this is true, both at the college and professional level, I think really at every level of football, but especially when it starts getting really competitive late high school, you know, into college and pros is you have to have that, that coach who is a teacher 
um, you know, who's able to teach fundamentals and techniques, which obviously Reese did, you know, if, whether he was coaching tight ends, offensive line, defense line, like he had superstars at every position. He had award winners at every position that he coached um, because he was so good at teaching the fundamentals, hammering the fundamentals, making sure that all the little details were in place uh, and then getting you to, to believe in yourself and understand the importance of those details. Um, so he was, he was absolutely critical for my development and the development of a lot of other guys. Um, you know, I've really, I've only cried twice in the last like decade that I can remember. Um, and, uh, and one of those times was when I heard that Reese had, uh, had decided to, to retire, um, you know, just gave him a call and, uh, you know, wanted to talk to him about kind of what he had, um, you know, what he had been through and, uh, you know, and what kind of was next for him. And, uh, you know, he really was kind of that figure that, uh, that kind of shaped, you know, my college experience experience and did that for so many other guys. Well, yeah. And he had a great career. Like when I was in high school, I actually, um, uh, faced, uh, his Iowa city West team and, and yeah. we got 50 pointed and I think I had a, uh, um, one play and I got excited, but we got 50 pointed and, and, you know, it just, you know, showed the players that he had that he had, but also, you know, the preparation and everything that, um, that he had as well. Yeah, he's a heck of a guy, man. You can't, it's, it's, that's hard to replace. I will say we've done, Kelvin is doing a heck of a job, uh, you know, with the defensive line and to, uh, just to get to, to probably, you know, follow Reese around and, and, you know, be his assistant and, and learn from him, uh, you know, both as a player and as a coach is absolutely invaluable. Um, but, uh, yeah, everything he touched, man, turned to gold. So, you know, from recruiting to on the field stuff to the type of guys that, uh, you know, that he put out, uh, you know, both professionally in the league and out of the league, like, you know, that comes from somewhere. And, and a lot of that came from Grandpa Reese. Absolutely. Now, um, who, who was your favorite Iowa teammate? Oh man, we had so many, we had a little click me, uh, Adam Geddes, Mike Daniels, uh, and Terrence Pryor, uh, were, were a little click. I was a, a Japanese minor. Um, and Terrence was the only other guy, uh, that I know of that, um, you know, that had or has taken Japanese as a class, uh, you know, since we were there. Um, so the two of us had a little, you know, understanding Then all of us were huge nerds, right? Everyone knows now about Mike, uh, you know, kind of being this big anime nerd. He's a big, uh, you know, Shonen Jump sort of dude. Um, and at the same time, like Adam Geddes is very much so like that as well. There's the story about the only time that, uh, that we ever got in trouble when we were at Iowa was when me and Geddes went down to the anime convention that was happening at our hotel during camp and, uh, and just got caught up in it. Didn't even realize we we're out past curfew. Um, you know, but, uh, came back, uh, you know, obviously had, had gotten busted, um, you know, for that and had to do log rolls the next morning in the, uh, in the complex. And Kirk kind of understood. He's like, you, you, you know, we did it, you know, down and back a couple of times. He's just like, you guys, like, you know, this is just, we're like, yeah, yeah, we know, we know, we know. He's like, all right, fine, get out of here. Um, so we definitely understood that, but yeah, we, you know, all of us were big anime nerds. We were all just kind of geeky kids who, you know, who found each other and just happened to be. Uh, you know, physical specimens at the same time who could play the game. That's awesome. Well, and, and I was going to save this till uh, later, but um, since you touched on it, I was going to ask you, what is your favorite anime? I don't know a lot about anime, but what is, uh, what do you um, watch? I'm for? weird. I'm really weird. Like uh, weird most good. guys, most guys get into, get like really into, uh, you know, I mentioned the Shonen Jump stuff. So you have like, uh, you know, Mike is a big uh, Dragon Ball guy. Uh, so you have your Dragon Balls, you have your Naruto's, you have your, you know, your One Piece and things like that. Uh, you know, I'm a big uh, uh, shoujo sort of dude, which is more like rom-coms and romance animes. But mm -hmm. there's got to be like a, a humorous element to it. Um, you know, so I, I, at one point in time in college, I had kept a list of all of the anime that I'd watched start to finish. That was my thing. Staying wow. out of trouble when I was at Iowa. Like other guys would go out to parties, they'd go out to the bars, go drink and this thing, the other thing. Like I would play Dungeons and Dragons with my with the friends from my Japanese class uh, twi uh, two nights a week. Uh, and then every other night I was either in my room playing video games or, uh, you know, or watching anime. That was kind of my thing when I got done with school and football was that was my, you know, unwind time. Um, so I did keep a list. Uh, you know, I had everything on there from school rumble to great teacher Onizuka. Uh, uh, more recently, uh, love Chunibyo and other delusions. Um, you know, I've been kind of getting into, uh, you know, that sort of vein um, has kind of been, uh, you know, renewed in me. So I do still like the Jujutsu Kaisens and the different like action you know, kind of real, um, you know, fighter sort of beat em up, uh, you know, shows. Uh, but, uh, but I like something with a little bit more humor, a little bit more kind of, you know, touchy feely sort of romance uh, aspect to it. I don't know why it's just my thing. 
Hey, I love it. I, I'm gonna have to do some homework on that now. I mean, I've been studying football. Now I'm gonna have to get into anime. Anime. It's a good time, man. You can get into yeah. it. There's a there's a little bit of everything for everybody. I'm trying to get my wife into it. Trying to find something. She's a big time horror, like you know, wow. serial killer buff. Uh, so it's kind of like, okay, you know, can you know, is there some psychological horror, you know, anime that I can get her into? Would she really like that? Um, but we'll see what happens. You know, Smart. turned her from a cyclone into a Hawkeye, so I imagine I can do that too. Well, and I guess I um, I didn't ask yet. Um, is it was there a point where you ever considered Iowa State? Oh God, no, no, I've, I've <laughs> hated Iowa State since the very beginning. Uh, that was, I mean, remember my earliest memories are of Iowa football are like the 2002 season. Uh, you know, and the only loss in that season was to Iowa State, a team that it should have had absolutely, you know, nothing to do with us on the field mm -hmm. that day. Um, but, uh, you know, big first half from us, big second half from from them. And Iowa's a, a or football's a, a tale of two halves. And so they ended up getting us in the end that year. Um, you know, but that's the, you know, that that one loss, right, potentially keeps us out of like the national championship game. Yeah. Um, you know, and I know the Rose Bowl that year didn't exactly go as you might or as we might have wanted to either. Um, but uh, but that, you know, kind of shaped. I was like, man, if it wasn't for them, we'd have had an undefeated season <laughs> da, 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 like that kind of carried forward. So, um, you know, I'd considered Georgia Tech at one point. I considered Stanford. I had, you know, these offers from a couple different places. But uh, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I had I had at one point considered like I had a, a scholarship offer from Stanford to go play defensive line there. Uh, wow. and it was like, man. You know, Stanford, the academics, right? The weather, like this, you know, the California sort of, you know, lifestyle. Um, like that's cool. But at the back of my mind, I was like, yeah, or I could walk on at Iowa and be an offensive lineman because that's what I really want to do. So, you know, had Iowa not offered me, honestly, I don't know. I don't know if I would have wound up somewhere else or not. Um, but uh, I've been a, a Hawkeye so long that I don't even, I don't even think it mattered. Right. Yeah. And so what is it about offensive linemen as opposed to defensive linemen that really kind of drew you uh, to it? Um, part of it is the winning percentage. <laughs> if you're if you're a good defensive lineman, you know you get uh, you know a, a couple of tackles and you know and maybe a sack in a game. Um, you know, so it, it's a lot of banging your head against the wall to to not get anywhere. Um, you know, as an offensive lineman, you are expected to win most of those fights. Um, you know, I I'm a big believer in kind of the protectorate aspect of it. Um, you know, you're trying to uh, you know to to hold the line uh, you know against this force that's coming after you. It's this weird dichotomy of, yes, you are on offense. You are the offensive party in this case, trying to score the ball. But at the same time, uh, you know, your job as an offensive lineman is to, is to create separation to, you know, to keep the defenders off of your quarterback to, uh, you know, provide a hole for the running back to, you know, to get through. So there's that aspect of kind of that, you know, yes, you're on offense, but you're also, you know, you're the attacking party, but you're the defensive part of the attacking party and you're protecting, uh, you know, the other people around you from, you know, from those who would do them harm. That part of it has always kind of drawn me. Absolutely. And, and so um, let's get into a little bit of that and, and then we'll kind of get back into like maybe your NFL draft uh, kind of experience. But um, just a couple of uh, statements. Um, offensive line play is a game of leverage. True or false? Uh, absolutely true. Um, in every aspect. I mean, we talk all the time about horizontal, horizontal and vertical leverage in terms of, uh, you know, technique, um, you know, just in general, if you understand how the human body works, uh, and you can, you know, pull the power producing angles out of somebody else's body and gain, uh, you know, leverage on them, uh, then you're gonna have a lot easier time controlling that person. Um, so I do think that, uh, you know, whether it's leverage to the whole, putting your body in the right position, uh, you know, leverage on the man, getting your, uh, you know, your pads under his helmet and, uh, you know, and your hands inside, um, you know, line on both sides is really, you know, both offensive line, defensive line is, uh, is ultimately a game of leverage. Um, and so understanding how that applies, I think play by play, understanding why, what different plays, where the point of leverage is on different plays, um, you make a big difference on whether or not that play is successful. And is it different, uh, different between, um, you know, the different positions on the line as far as kind of where you get leverage, um, you know, on, on the defensive player? Or? I think a lot of it depends on the play. Um, you know, we're a big zone team uh, at Iowa. So whether it's, uh, you know, whether you're doing inside zone or outside zone, whether you're going, uh, you know, plus one in the offensive line is trying to move up to the front side linebacker or minus one and you have like a fullback insert and you're trying to go to the backside linebacker. Um, you know, it all depends on where the leverage on that is. Um, you know, you want to make sure that, um, you know, like I noticed, we, you know, there's the, the play where the running back kind of starts forward and then wraps back, uh, you know, so kind of the, the, the 
the fake of trying to get leverage in one direction, get the defensive lineman to cross your hat and then, uh, you know, force him over so that you kind of regain leverage where you want it. It's kind of a mental chess match in cases like that. Um, you know, it's, it's all about understanding the play, the way that the play is structured, where it's supposed to go, what can happen if you do and don't do your job. And then if you do lose leverage, how can you regain the advantage? Um, you know, ultimately our job is always, if we're running, Side to side, if we're running some sort of stretch and you get out leveraged, well, the only place left for that guy to go then is his bench. So you push him all the way out of bounds, you know, into his bench, into the stands, whatever you got to do to to regain kind of your, you know, your advantage in that situation. Well, um, here's another one. Never give up pressure for position. Mm, that's that one kind of depends a little bit more to me. Um I think that uh, that there's a time and a place for for good for good pressure. Um, you know, in my I was taught a lot of different things in the NFL than I was at Iowa, um, and so we had some very different opinions from some very different coaches uh, as far as what pressure really meant and what a good position was and how to get a good position back. Um, you know, within that, I think on occasion, if you're like, um, you know, if you're a team that runs more like draws, like we had a sprint draw, um, you know, at, uh, at Philadelphia where you would literally, your goal was to, to allow a certain degree of pressure, but within, with a good position, um, because you wanted that defensive player to be in a certain spot, uh, you know, that was considered a pressure spot, but it really put him out of position for the play. Um, you know, when we're just talking straight up pass rush, um, then, you know, to a certain extent, I have to agree with that. Uh, but ultimately, I do think that, again, it comes down to the play structure. What are you what are you trying to do? Um, you know, is what really is a, is a good position for you and a bad position for the defensive lineman? Um, you know, it's not always what you would think. It's not always what traditionally is considered, uh, you know, good or bad, depending on the play structure. And when you're like studying, uh, you know, film on, you know, particular players or when you have been, um, do you kind of, you know, maybe use uh, their aggressiveness against them on some of those things? Yeah, that's a big part of, of where I think that um, a lot of that can be done with play calling. Um, you know, we used to watch uh, an, un, an inordinate amount of film. Um, and certainly, you know, if you're if you're a team that runs a lot of trap, um, you know, you want to use that against, uh, you know, somebody who's maybe an overly aggressive uh, defensive lineman. Um, you get high rushers, uh, you know, maybe more of a draw play where they take themselves out of position, um, you know, by just rushing up the field too far. Um, it, it really does come down to, you know, if you're, if you have a guy who is being overly aggressive, like how do you take advantage, uh, of that? Um, you know, if they fly fast over the top then you want to, you know, boot legs and, uh, you know, and, and stuff that, that is a little bit more misdirection-y perhaps so that they take themselves out of position. Um, so it, you know, using their own tendencies against them, uh, you know, it's, it's a big part of the game, but, uh, a lot of that does come from film study. You've got to be able to know who and when you can do that too. All right. I have another right. one here. Uh, pass protection is a passive activity. Oh, absolutely not. No, no. I think any offensive lineman will, uh, would scoff at that is absolutely not. Um, there's a thing today. So one of the, there's a Twitter account I follow. Well, the, uh, the Joe Moore award one, right. They do their pancake pancake blocks of the week. Mm -hmm. Um, and this week, uh, you know, Linderbaum's been on there several times, mm -hmm. uh, this week he was on there, but it wasn't actually him. Like the, the guy was rushing him. Um, but I think it was shoddy, uh, you know, came back, um, you know, off of uh, slide protection uh, and just leveled, uh, you know, the Wisconsin guy. Like if you are if you're constantly sitting back in pass protection, then you're just going to get wrecked. Uh, pass protection has to be something where the physicality of the game is felt most, uh, you know, in if somebody's going to jump, they need to pay for it. Um, you know, if somebody is a fast, high, hard rushing kind of guy. Uh, then there's ways to use their momentum against them, but you have to do it in a violent way. Now, uh, uh, talk about slide protection. Uh, tell me a little, little bit more about that. I mean, there's different ways to do it. There's your full slide. You can slide the entire offensive line, uh, you know, and bring a running back to the backside, um, you know, to, to cut a defensive end or an outside linebacker. You can uh, play your traditional slide, uh, you know, which starts with the uncovered man, and then you're just working to an outside linebacker, and the running back kind of duels the backside to linebackers. Um, so there's different philosophies, I think, around slide protection, um, you know, and, and how you call it and how you play it. Um, but, uh, you know, ultimately, with, with any sort of pass protection, really, it's a game of math. 
uh, which I think is kind of fun, right? It's about how many people do they have in a certain position? How many, because of how many of the people that they have, how, how many can they bring? That was something that I learned a lot about in the offense or in the NFL was the math of slide protection of if we are in Chip Kelly's system, the center was responsible for audibles and for changing the pass protection, uh, you know, if necessary. So if you came up and you saw based on the math that we have three wide receivers over on the left and they have three guys to cover three guys. Uh, and then you know that, okay, so there's three to cover three over there. There's a linebacker, you know, right here, who's on the running back side of the ball. So that's really four over four. So they can't bring anybody or else there's somebody who's not covered. So it would be our job to either switch the slide and go the other way. Or if we looked out and saw, okay, there's an outside linebacker, he's literally not covering anybody. Or there's two guys who can cover this, you know, tight end or whatever. Like then we would shift the whole protection that way and just pick up whoever we needed to pick up on that side. So it's, you know, you can, you can slide in different ways, but ultimately it's a game of math. Now, were there uh, certain things that you said on the line audit to auto, you know, audible to those things or. Yeah. I'm taking too many shots in the head to remember. Oh yeah. <laughs> there's, everyone's got different terminology. You have different yeah. schools of thought and, you know, different teams will use the same terms because the same coach went to one place or another. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but ultimately, yeah, I mean, communication is arguably the most important part of the offensive line. It's five guys moving as one. You all have to know what everyone else is doing. Now, um, you know, maybe not in the NFL, but like when you were in, you know, uh, at Iowa or even in high school, um, did you ever like take it offense? You know, if, if um, they asked like a, a, a running back to kind of, you know, help, you know, um, on the, uh, you know, block at all or. Oh no, you love that stuff. You want you want those guys to get a shot, right? Big six, six defensive end running off the edge and, uh, you know, a little running back comes up and clocks him under the chin. Like, that's great. Um, you know, it's a, it's a tactic. It's a strategy. Keep a tight end in so you can double team a really good off or, uh, you know, defensive tackle or, uh, bring a running back off the edge to, you know, to chip a guy so that the offensive lineman can play more inside than outside. Like it's, uh, it's help. And especially on the offensive line, we understand, uh, you know, helping each other, knowing where your help is coming from so that you know how to set based on if you have somebody on your inside hip or not. Um, you know, it's, it's always appreciated. And, and uh, tight end wise, you had, was it, uh, uh, CJ Fedorowicz, was he there when you were there? Uh, we had, uh, Tony, the golden boy Moyaki. Oh yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got the Moyaki years, which was always fun. We had, yeah. uh, you know, Alan Reisner. We had some good, oh, yeah. tight end. good tight ends. Exactly. Tight end but, you. Uh, yeah, always a couple NFL guys on that uh, in that room. All right, I have one more here. Uh, offensive linemen finish their play at the echo of the whistle. Um, I mean, that's what you're shooting for. I think that's the hardest thing to to get high school kids to understand. I volunteer, uh, you know, coach at the at the high school that I went to, um, and that's a big part of of the game is just getting them to understand that if you uh, if you like, you can beat somebody after the whistle if you just consistently outwork them if you consistently you know they stop their feet and you keep your feet going uh you know even if it's just another two or three steps like that gets in their head they start to you know question their own uh you know kind of toughness they get uh frustrated having to deal with you play after play after play and all oh, this guy always you know he just keeps pushing uh you know that that sort of mentality um uh, can can break other teams um, and so that was always a big focus as far as I was, you always finish downfield. If it's a pass play, you, you know, you sprint down the field afterwards and, uh, you know, and help the guy up. If there's a fumble, you want to make sure you're down there to, you know, try and get the ball. Um, and if you're blocking somebody, you, you finish, uh, you know, we would just call it finishing. Uh, but that's, that's what you have to do every single play. There's no excuses. Absolutely. And now, um, the, uh, you know, feet aspect is that's pretty important as well. In terms of like moving feet. Yeah. Yeah. And just, um, you're, uh, so I had a chance, um, 2019 to go to the uh, bears training camp and, you know, I, uh, saw, you know, Kyle long, you know, teaching, you know, a younger offensive lineman, you know, I got a, a great picture, you know, of him kind of just, um, it must've been like pass protection, you know, and, and just kind of watch him get off the ball. Um, did you, you know, have like a teammate that, that helped you with that? And, and then how important was like that? i uh, just, you know, getting your uh, feet set, right. And everything like that. Um, it's always nice to have a veteran guy who will do that. Um, you know, we, in college, you see it a lot more because it is a lot more of a kind of, um, uh, uh, a one team, one dream sort of, you know, mentality. It's like, well, we're all here and we're all wearing the same color. Uh, and we're all, you know, kind of in this thing together. The NFL is a lot more of a business. It's a lot more, you know, oh, you're the guy who's backing me up. It's not like in, you know, three years I'm going to be gone and you have to play this position. It's like, 
if you are better than me, then you're taking food off of my family's plate. So I was very fortunate in the NFL to be in a locker room in Philadelphia where that was not the case, where the veterans were very generous with their time. Um, you know, Jason Peters, um, you know, for uh, kind of all the crap that he got at the end of his you know career in Philadelphia uh, was a guy who was invaluable to that locker room because every young person could learn from him. He would help guys who were undrafted free agents. He'd help guys who were, uh, you know, third or fourth rounders. Like if you stuck around after practice, if you needed help, especially as a tackle, um, you know, he was willing to to work with anybody and give them their give them his time and expertise. Um you know, at Iowa, it was, it's a lot harder to do that in college because you have things like classes, right? <laughs> you work out in the morning, you go to class, you come back for practice, you go back to class, you come back for film, you go back for homework. Like it's, uh, you know, there's there's a lot to do. So it's a lot harder to take an extra, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes after practice and just sit there and do sets. Um, but sometimes we would take five you know, take five, 10 minutes and, uh, you know, and just come out and, uh, you know, and set like it's a one technique set, like it's a three technique set, like he's wide set, like it's a four eye, uh, you know, like, you know, work on kind of where are you placing yourself? Um, cause ultimately what I try and teach my high school kids is, uh, you know, there's a line between you and the quarterback and the defensive lineman, and you want to keep yourself so that that line is going through you. Um, and so in order to do that, you have to move your feet. You can't, if, you know, the second you stop or reach out, or if you set at the wrong angle, then the line moves. And as soon as it moves past your hip, you're dead. So, you know, keeping that, that line in, uh, you know, in good position, um, is all about keeping your body in the right position. Well, um, in the NFL, you, um, you had a chance, you moved from guard to center. Um, what was the the toughest part of, of that? I mean, you, you talk about, you know, uh, you know, that, that aspect of that line, it, what was the toughest part of like maybe uh, changing positions in the NFL, the highest uh, level? I liked it better. I was always a better center. And I think that, you know, at one point in time in my career, there was a consideration of moving or at least having the ability to uh, to move to center if necessary, um, you know, before my, my junior year when I tore my shoulder, um, you know, and that kind of put that to bed for the time being. But I always liked center a lot better. Um, it's a much quicker game from that position. Everybody's on you a lot faster, which I enjoyed. Um, you know, I was always, I, I'm not an overly big guy, so I played with quickness and technique, which, uh, lent itself well to being a center. I think the hardest part was just the mental aspect. Um, you know, because as in Chip's system, cause I moved, I made the move when Chip Kelly came in, um, you know, officially that system puts a lot on the center. He wants his quarterbacks to be able to, to move quickly, to see the field, uh, you know, to do the math, uh, you know, in their heads, to know where the read is and where the, you know, the, the pass is. Um, and so he wanted to free them up mentally. So he put a lot of that on the center, identifying the front, identifying the blitz, changing the protection, uh, you know, getting the line, you know, lined up and moving to where they needed to be. Um, so one thing that was great about that was I learned how to read defenses how to read blitzes based on safety alignment and read protections uh you know based on linebackers position uh, you know relative to the safeties and how far the corners are on and off and stuff like that um so that was a really cool part of of that game but it was a lot of work to get to that level absolutely and um you talked about you know being in uh, chip kelly's system and um you you um have you know worked or you know played alongside some, uh, you know, different style quarterbacks, um, uh, Nick Foles, right. And, and did you play alongside Michael Vick or with him? Um, so it was kind of cool that year. Like Mike started out as the starter and Nick was the backup. So I was Nick's center and then Mike got hurt and Nick took over the the starting spot. And so as Mike worked his way back, I was Mike's center. So I kind of got a, you know, a feel for both of them. Well, yeah. And so like, I, I've heard this a little bit about, you know, in the Chicago sports, um, you know, talking about a uh, line play um, with Justin Fields. And, and so it was interesting. Uh, um, I think um, it was Olin Krutz uh, talked about the difference between blocking for a mobile QB and a pocket passer. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, it's just a, a different kind of mentality. I think, uh, you know, a pocket passer, you always kind of know where they're going to be. The play is designed a certain way. They're going to sit in the pocket. They're going to do their thing. They're going to step back. Then they're going to step up, um, you know, so you can't give up as much, you know, pressure up the middle and the tackles can run their guys kind of high and yada, yada. For mobile quarterbacks, it's a lot harder to know where they're going to be. Um, holding calls 
I would imagine if you did a metric of pocket passes versus mobile quarterbacks, you'd find that there's a lot more holding on the offensive line with mobile guys. Um, just because, I mean, holding happens on every play, right? We're literally, mm -hmm. what you're taught on in, in just, college yeah. as an offensive lineman is how to hold without getting caught. Um, but when a guy moves in a certain way, if you maintain that hold, that's where you're going to get called, right? The refs are looking for certain things. So with a mobile quarterback, uh, you know, if he suddenly just, you know, the left tackle runs his guy high upfield and the mobile quarterback, uh, you know, instead of stepping up in the pocket, sprints out to the left to get in space, uh, you know, the first thing that's going to happen is the defensive line is going to go Nyeh! and try and follow that guy. Uh, so if you've got a hold, you know, on, on his breastplate and normally you're just sitting there like anchoring, waiting for him to push into you. And then all of a sudden he, you know, lunges out to the side. Uh, that's where you can, you know, you might lose that, uh, you know, that ability to hold without getting called. They're going to see you kind of tug him back in. So there's that's the biggest thing I think is just is is knowing where your quarterback is. It's hard to protect somebody if you don't know where they are. Absolutely. Well, and you talk about holding. It's always interesting. Um, what is going through the mind um, of an offensive lineman when you get called for holding or maybe one of your teammates gets called for holding? Uh, I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I never, I never held in my career. I don't know what anybody's talking about. <laughs> never needed to, right? Yeah. We don't, we don't do that. No, it's um, sometimes, you know, Right. If you if sometimes you get away with it and, you know, um, but uh, but most of the time you, you know, you want to play it off like, oh, man, no, I didn't. I wasn't I wasn't holding that guy. And even if you watch the film, it's like, oh, you can clearly see that I let go of him right there. It's like, well, yeah, after you, you know, like ripped his jersey in half. So um, you have to you, you have to have that mentality of, of I'm never holding, um, you know, because if you if you change your style of play, uh, you know, too much, then then you start to, to lose your game. And is there ever, was there ever like a, a good hold, so to speak, or good is relative. Um, you know, you, uh, I don't know that there's necessarily been a, a holding call that was, that I would consider, you know, good. Um, but I think there were certainly holds that, uh, that I and other people got away with that, uh, you know, that probably opened up holes or let a pass get off or something like that. I mean, you see it every, every Saturday, every Sunday, there's one where the announcers are like, oh man, I can't believe the referees missed that. Right. And it was like, oh, it's a 30 yard pass downfield. that's going to change the entire game. So if you're on one side, that's a really bad, uh, you know, call. If you're on the other side, it's like, Ooh, dodged a bullet there. Um, you know, so you consider that a good hold. And were you ever having conversations or maybe even allowed to um, have conversations with the referees or was that just kind of, you know, some of the quarterbacks or, you know, about those, those calls or anything like that? I mean, some guys in the NFL will do that. Um, we didn't at Iowa. Obviously there's a big, there's a big, big gap between your, your college players and your NFL players. Um, you know, college players are still, you know, students, uh, you know, they're, they're kids who a lot of them are still just learning the game. Um, you know, professionals, NFL guys, like they've been doing it a minute. They understand, uh, you know, they have more interaction with the refs probably than the coaches do. Um, you know, a lot of them, one thing that, that, uh, and I come back to Jason Peters again, one thing that he was really good about was kind of buttering up the refs before the game, right? Go over while they're having their huddle, have a conversation with them. You've been playing the game for a decade. So it's like, you know, all the guys, there's only so many refs. Um, you know, so go over, ask them how they're doing. How's your wife? How's your family? Blah, blah, blah. Like they would just chat them up. Uh, you know, and JP probably false started three, four times a game, but he was so quick on the get off. It was such a bang, bang sort of thing that if there was a question in their minds, it was like, oh, that's just Jason Peters being quick. Right. And you just let him go because he's a cool guy and you like him. And, uh, you know, and maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. So I suspect that happens a lot more with quarterbacks than it does with anybody else. But um, but yeah, in the NFL, you see that. And who was the hardest defensive player that you faced? Um, I think, I mean, in practice every day, having to go against, uh, you know, like Mike Daniels was tough. Obviously, he's a relentless guy. Those guys that the, the hardworking guys are the worst. Um, you know, me and Carl Klug spent a lot of time smacking into each other. Um, you know, going against Mike was always tough. Um, you know, in the NFL, you get guys who are more so like physical specimens, but maybe their their effort level isn't always there. Like Fletcher Cox can beat anybody anytime he wants to. Um, you know, he never he would never lose a rep to me ever in his life. He's fucking whatever he is. I'm sorry, I don't know if I can swear, no, <laughs> but he's he's like, you know, he's like six, seven. He's got the arms of a guy who's who's nine feet tall and he's stronger than an ox and just 
I mean, you know, athletic freak. And I'm sitting here with my, you know, like I've, I've got long arms for a dude who's six two. I'm six two with the arms of a six five guy. But I mean, he extends his arms and I can't touch him. Um, you know, so to be that big, that long, that strong, uh, you know, and have that much power, um, you know, that's just one of those things where it's like, you know, thank God he doesn't just crush me every play because he could, <laughs> you know. Right. Now, are there any current, um, you know, linemen that you kind of just, um, you know, look to now and you just you just love watching? I mean, I'm a Linderbaum fanboy. I was, I've, I've made a couple of calls about the Hawks that turned out to be true in terms of personnel, um, you know, two, three years before the thing happened, which I, you know, makes me feel good about my ability to still kind of analyze the game. Um, and one of them was, uh, you know, was Lindy when he came in, um, you know, it was like, this guy's going to win a Remington before he leaves. Uh, you know, the, the, the background that he has, uh, you know, um, you know, under being a defensive lineman, kind of having that aggressiveness, that understanding, um, you know, of, of the way that offensive linemen play the wrestling background, uh, you know, watching him and, and, and Tristan Wirfs, like the highlights about that and making the switch to offensive line. Like the first couple of times he played, it was just like, there is a needness and an aggressiveness to this guy. There's a quickness. He would make some athletic moves. And I'm like, I have not seen anybody since Jason Kelsey make a move like that like he was just a guy who was like he's gonna he's got it you know he's gonna be the guy so I love watching him play even now especially having make it made that move to center and so having a little bit more understanding and respect for some of the insane things that he actually does from that position um you know is really fun to watch now do you have any um like connection with him at all or like a contact or not really no, okay. never yeah. met him, never talked to him. Um, me and Austin Blythe were really tight for for a while. I helped with his recruiting, uh, you know, when he was coming into Iowa. Yeah. Um, so me and him stayed in touch for a while. It was always fun to watch him play, um, you know, and I still like, uh, you know, watching uh, the guys that I know uh, in the NFL play the game. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't watch nearly as much NFL football anymore. Um, you know, it's mostly college. I have three kids. It's hard to watch any football, mm -hmm. but, uh, but Iowa games are a must. Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, talk a little bit about uh, your draft day experience. Like, um, I, I mean, a little bit about me. I had a chance um, growing up. Uh, one of um, uh, my dad's uh, friends um, was actually a friend of the program of Iowa, and uh, so he would throw parties, um, you know, at, at his house and everything. And we were actually uh, there when John Alt got the NFL draft call um, as right. a kid. Uh, and, and so, I mean, I was way too young to really understand that, but talk about your, uh, draft day experience. And I mean, you were a uh, fifth rounder, I mean, uh, right. And, um, just talk about that kind of day and, and that experience. Yeah, it was cool. Um, you know, you kind of know going into it, you have your agent and your agent, you know, has talked to a couple teams. You might've taken a couple of visits. Um, so you kind of have an idea of where you think you're going to go. Um, you know, and you kind of have an idea of who you think you might go to. Now, there's always going to be surprises, of course, um, you know, and the draft can happen a number of different ways. I think one analyst uh, had me uh, picked to be Mr. Irrelevant, the, the last player taken in the draft, um, you know, but we always kind of felt like it was like, okay, there's a low chance, but a chance that you're like, you know, a second day guy, like late third round, maybe just based on who the teams are, what their draft order is and what their needs are. Um, and, uh, and Philly ended up taking Danny Watkins in the first round. So we were like, okay, that's probably not going to be the case. And, you know, for you, um, but then going into that third day, I was like, okay, so this is the day, right? If it's going to happen, it's going to happen today, obviously. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of where and when. And so we had effectively, my agent had told me, you know, these three teams are the three teams that I think based on my conversations with them and, you know, kind of their interest in you and, and whatnot, uh, you know, one of these three teams is going to be the one and all three of them picked in a row, on in the fifth round that day um so it was just kind of like okay this is your block right if it's going to happen this is likely the block where it's going to happen um and uh and so they give you a call like a little while beforehand um, i think i got a call whatever it was five ten minutes um you know beforehand with them going hey we've got a pick coming up just want to let you know that we're gonna you know take you with that uh, with that pick so keep your phone nearby after you know it goes across the screen and everything it's like we'll call you a minute later and uh, you can talk to the coach and the uh you know the general manager and, and all that stuff so you you have a, a pretty good idea um of what's going to happen on the day of um and uh and so barring you know extreme surprises in one way or in one direction or the other uh you you kind of uh it's still surreal 
right? To, to be a part of that and, uh, you know, and see your name scroll across the screen and see your highlights and stuff and, uh, you know, and know that you're a part of that. Um, but it's, I don't think, you know, there's, there's a reason that, uh, that whenever they pan to the camera of like somebody, uh, you know, it's like, they're already on the couch with their family surrounding them, like watching the TV, like they know, they know that there's, you know, what kind of area that they're probably going to go in. Um, you know, so that's, it's kind of a, a cool thing, um, to, to be a part of and have that in the back of your mind, like, this is the day, you know, <laughs> like this is, you know, this is when life changes. So that's cool. And, and who was it that ended up giving you the call? Um, so they start with, I'm trying to think who starts. I think you're, the GM starts. So Howie is the first one who, who gave me a call. Um, and then from there you talk to, uh, you know, the head coach briefly. Um, so I talked for a little bit with Andy. And then at the time, uh, Howard Mudd was the offensive line coach. And I had been out to Philly. They flew me out there and a couple of other guys to, uh, you know, they were thinking of drafting to, you know, to have a dinner, to go through a workout, to meet your coach and do all this other stuff. Um, so I had a, a, a pre-existing relationship, uh, you know, with these guys through that. Um, so I, I knew I knew Howard especially pretty darn well um and uh but they you know you have your little five minute conversation and they and they go well congratulations go celebrate with your family and uh we'll see you out here tomorrow at noon it's like oh wow wow, all right and you basically you know that's not a lot of it's not quite that quick but they don't there's not a lot of time um you know you you pack up what you have you find a you know an apartment or sometimes they'll put you up in a like in a long an extended stay for like two uh, weeks or something like that um, but they, you know, they ship you out there pretty quick and you're, you're a part of that organization now. And yeah, so you, you, you did play, uh, for Andy Reed then. Mm-hmm. And, and what was that trans transition, uh, transition from him to chip like then? That's well, very different systems. Uh, they're extremely different, co- uh, uh, coaches. Uh, Andy's a very, um, he's a, he's an NFL coach in that, uh, he knows the NFL, and the way that players are, that these are not kids anymore. These are grown men, you know, with families, with paychecks, with responsibilities, yada, yada. Um, You know, he was very much so, you guys know what it took to get you here. So just do that thing. And as long as you perform, I don't really care, Uh, you know, what else kind of goes on. Like you, you want guys to stay out of trouble and everything. And he's, you know, he's a a big high character guy, Um, but they, they drafted for, the types of people that he wanted and he gave you a leeway in a certain extent because this was a business. Um, Chip was less of a businessman. He was a college coach and that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way because he treated us like college players, which I was very used to, you know, it was still the Iowa, uh, you know, mentality of, of, you know, super hard work and putting in the hours and, uh, you know, and he had a very unique structure. He was very science. Andy was very, you know what it took to get here do that thing. And Chip was very, we are going to micromanage every single aspect of your life so that you are, you know, you are turned into the ideal version of who you can be as an athlete, which in college is great in the pros, not so much. So it didn't, you know, it didn't jive with a lot of people, but they were very, very different in their mentality and approach. Yeah. What was uh, Chip like, uh, you know, tracking your sleep and all that stuff like that or a little bit of everything, you know, yeah. they track your hydration, uh, you know, you peed in a cup every single morning, which rubbed a lot of guys the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they did do sleep studies during camp. They kind of got away from that when you got into, uh, you know, the rest of the the season. Um, but he really, uh, you know, everything from like acupuncture and cold, uh, like cryo, you know, chambers in uh, like the complex to, uh, you know, we had like a former Navy SEAL combat trainer. Um, you know, who would work with, uh, with like the defensive linemen on hand to hand stuff, because it's, you know, it's a lot of hand fighting in the trenches, um, like every, you know, aspect, uh, of kind of the game he wanted to be able to measure and control, uh, you know, and part of that was measuring and controlling the players, uh, you know, to make sure that they were in peak condition, um. I think sometimes his practice philosophies didn't necessarily, uh, you know, jive with that in terms of what we're going to do on game day. But, uh, but at the same time, like he was, he was very, very micromanaging. Well, speaking about kind of uh, managing and and talk about a little bit, like some of your offense, your offensive coordinators and maybe position coaches, Uh, you were um, with uh, Bill Lazor, who's with the bears now, or uh, tell about like some of those who kind of made an impression on, on you. Um, coordinators are cool. It's kind of a different, uh, I think it's a different mentality for them. Uh, you know, especially because when you're offensive or when your uh, coordinator is your head coach, I think that's something that's, that's very interesting, or maybe not even that your coordinator is your head coach, but like we had a offensive coordinator in Philadelphia 
but he didn't call plays, right? His job was to like make sure that the offense was ready on game day and then Chip would actually do the play calling. I always thought that was a weird dichotomy. Um, one thing that I really liked about Iowa was that, you know, Kirk was the manager. He knew that his job as the head coach was almost more of an administrator where he was dealing with, you know, the press and the public. He was dealing with the, with the university president. He was, uh, you know, kind of that guy who controlled the quality of the entire program. Um, but he lets his coordinators coordinate, right? Let's them run uh, stuff and call their plays. And, uh, you know, and he, he has a lot of trust in his staff to, to do their jobs. Uh, you know, whereas when you do get into the NFL, I think, or at least in my experience, um, you know, you do get a lot more of like, as the head coach, it's my offense, so I'm going to run it. Or as the head coach, it's my defense, so I'm going to run it. Um, so there is a little bit more, I think, of an ego that goes on in that in that way. Um, so we did have some, we had some good coordinators, I think. Uh, the other thing that's weird about the NFL is how temporary it is. Is how, you know, guys just kind of come in and come out and a dude will be at his locker one day and he'll be gone the next day. He either got cut or got traded or, you know, was on practice squad, was on practice, was off practice squad. Um, and the same thing with with coaches, um, you know, you bring in a, a coach for a year and it doesn't work out and he's just gone. Uh, you know, we're halfway through the season, right? Andy didn't uh, didn't make it all the way through my second season. Uh, you know, so at one point in time, it's just like the whole philosophy of the team changes from one week to the next. And uh, and so you don't really get to know a lot of people super well unless you are in a place that has a tremendous amount of stability, which some teams do. I just happen to be at Philadelphia in a time of great upheaval. And, and you like talk about a little bit about that, like, cutting experience because uh, you were uh, cut a, a few times talk about that i mean that's um just kind of like um mentality just trying to um kind of you know get through that onto the next opportunity or um i think it's you know it's kind of person to person team to team different guys uh you know my job my i my mentality was always that i was kind of a peace player you know when i was the backup center it was like okay my job is to be ready in case anything happens to jason uh when i was uh in that position kind of in the final season you know i saw my position as being the 53rd man on the roster it was like okay i'm a guy who can, can who can maintain a positive attitude no matter what um you know i'm a i'm good i know that i can play if they need me but it's also you know i'm in a position where uh you know where i know that there's a couple of guys uh you know probably ahead of me on the depth chart so it was like so what can i do to be an asset to the team uh you know i can be that guy who linebacker you know goes down with a uh, with a rolled ankle, he's going to be out for the next two weeks. Okay, we're going to cut Julian. Julian, hang out in your you know your apartment for the next two weeks. We'll call you back. Uh, you know when his treatment's over, they can bring in a, a linebacker from free agency to play for the next two weeks, and they cut that guy and they bring me back. Um, you know, so there's so my mentality around it was always very positive. Very, I'm just going to you know this is my place on the team right now. This is my part. This is what I can do because there's a lot of people who wouldn't take that who would just be like oh you cut me f you i'm out of here um you know and they'd be on the first train back home um and i'm a lot more chill <laughs> than that so that helped um but you are always you're always interested in that next opportunity because anytime you do get cut there is another there's a chance for something else um i knew at my at that point that i was out of practice squad eligibility the way that practice squad works in the nfl um i couldn't be on anyone's practice squad so the odds of me getting picked up mid season uh you know with very little uh, playing experience uh, and no real starting experience outside of, you know, preseason and special teams. Um, I knew that my odds of getting picked up by another team were very low. Um, but early in your career, or if you do still have practice squad eligibility with the way that the rules work, um, you know, you're always kind of, you know, in the back of your mind, it's like, you know, am I, if you cut me on a Tuesday, am I still going to be here on a Wednesday? Um, you know, that sort of thing. Cause there's a lot of movement that can happen. In in that kind of interim, like couple weeks, I mean, are you just kind of working out as normal, or, or how, what, what's that like? Yeah, I had a uh, I became really good friends with Mike Bamiro, who's a boxer now, but he was from uh, you know uh, the Poconos out there, um, really from New York, and then moved to the Poconos. But he was uh, you know he was a guy who was also kind of hanging out, waiting for his next opportunity. Um, and so we would you know get together in a park, uh, we'd pass rush each other, and uh, you know we'd go to his. He had a, a gym uh, that he would go to in the mornings, and they had a bag uh, you know there and a and a trainer. So we would uh, you know go through run drills and and stuff like that and work on you know double teams and uh, reach blocks and whatnot so it's it's kind of up to you to maintain yourself during that time uh you know some guys have personal trainers some guys have nutrition uh nutritionists uh you know for me i always kind of knew when i was coming back so it was just like well there's a 
there's a gym here and there's a grocery store down the street. So I'll just keep myself in shape and, uh, you know, I'm not going to get too fat in the next two weeks. So I might as well just hang out and do my thing. And it was it tough to kind of, you know, uh, kind of know it was finally uh, over at the, at the end then? Not really. I was kind of ready. You know, I had, I'd had my, I'd ruptured my L5S1. I had had my back surgery. I kind of knew, uh, you know, the opportunities uh, were going to be pretty slim at that point. Um, I was expensive for a backup being five years in the league minimum for me was, was pretty, was, uh, you know, higher than a lot of people will pay for somebody who's had back surgery when you got, you know, young, healthy college kids hanging out there looking for a chance. Um, my, my only regret was at one point in time, my agent asked me if I'd be interested in going to play in Canada. And my mindset at the time was nah, I'm done. Like, I don't, you know, I think I'm, I think where I'm at in life, uh, you know, and in my career, I was like, I don't think I want to, you know, drag my family up there or leave them down here. Um, and, uh, in hindsight, you know, I kind of wish I had taken that, uh, taken that up. Cause I think it would have been a lot of fun, but a very different experience. Um, but, uh, but outside of that, I was, I was pretty ready when the, when the time came to, to be done. Awesome. Well, uh, this has been fantastic. And I know I'm, I'm, I could probably talk with you forever. I'm definitely uh, never ready to, to stop talking football, but I, I want to respect your time. I, I appreciate you, um, you know, taking your time and uh, sharing your experiences and, and everything. So thanks again. My pleasure, man. I hope this goes well for you. Absolutely. And once again, this has been NFL outdated cover two series with former Iowa and NFL offensive lineman, Julian uh, Vandervelde. Thanks again. Thanks. Guys. See you.